And now the continuation of the story of Rising Star. We had the first peer-reviewed paper about Homo Naledi, and here we're going to discuss exactly what it means. Hey guys, friends of World of Paleoanthropology. Today I just wanted to do a video on something that's quite important that came out uh, yesterday, actually, and that would be the first peer-reviewed paper on the recent Homo Naledi findings that Dr. Berger et al. came out with a few months ago, you know, talking about potential burial, which we knew about, but also the chance of fire use in the cave with hearths being found, supposedly, as well as, of course, as many of you possibly know, the possible signs of art or engravings inside Rising Star, which these would just be... I mean, they are massive discoveries if they prove true. And, you know, there's just been a lot of fervor going around about these topics. And that's because, and I just want to go into this a little bit, and I know I have before, this is not typically how science is done. And what I mean by that is usually you make a discovery or you find something out or you form a hypothesis, a question, you go about answering it, you gather evidence. You have others look at your evidence, they add to it, they detract from it, you work together you publish, or you try to publish a paper, the journal looks at it, the journal reviews it, they send it back to you for revision, so on and so forth, and they accept it, it gets published, and it gets put into the scientific literature. That is not what happened with these announcements from Dr. Berger's team. What they did was they had preprints come out, in a journal that did not require these articles to be peer-reviewed first. So that was kind of a problem to begin with. So this information that was coming out had only been looked at by Dr. Berger's team, no one from the outside, which to many people might not sound like a problem, but when we're talking about science, when everything's about peer review and getting things checked and double-checked and triple-checked, because the point of science is to be able to replicate things. The other day when I posted about this paper coming out, someone said, well, those people weren't in the cave. How could they know? Well, it's the job of Lee's team to write the information and the evidence to a point where anyone who's not even in the cave can understand what's going on and replicate the results. That's not the case. And I'm going to explain why, and I'm going to explain what the paper talks about. So this paper uh, is coming out from some leading researchers in the field and from, from huge institutions. They all collaborated on this, and they went point by point on some of the big ideas that Lee is presenting. And before I continue, I just want to point out, you know, there aren't, there's no animosity here. I don't, I'm not mad at Lee for this media campaign. He's doing what he thinks is right. I don't agree with it. That's my opinion. Uh, I don't think people should be fighting over what's going on. It's not something worth fighting over. We just need to agree or disagree and then find out how to move forward. I do think Lee has made some big missteps, such as launching fossils into space for, you know, media campaign, but he got the permission. There's There's no other way of saying it. He got the permission from the uh, universities. The He got it from everyone, so... I don't like it, but it happened. But let's get back to this paper that came out uh, peer-reviewing some of the things, kind of all the things that Lee and his team said. So let's start with burial. So first of all, Lee's team is claiming that there's this pit, okay, and that it was dug by Homo Naledi and a body was intentionally placed in the pit, and that is their most significant sign of burial because the rest of the case is I mean there's fossils that are scattered around kind of and like like Lee said in many documentaries it's the whole floor and the walls are just filled with bones so I mean is it really a burial or is it an accumulation of fossils well that was kind of what was going on until they made the statement that yes we we have a burial here look at it uh but without really excavating or even 3d scanning it in a more full way I and many others don't really see how you're going to be able to tell what this is without rendering some remote sensing. Um, now, this pit doesn't have any specific borders even in it, such as there's no bottom or top. It's just kind of 
there. It's more like a hollow, the paper says, a more natural hollow than a dug pit that uh, this body, this homology was possibly placed into. Now, another issue with this burial is a burial is typically if an individual placed in maybe, a, uh, you know, tucked in their knees to their chest and whatnot. Doesn't have to be that way, of course. But this pit was filled with an individual that was not in any uh, specific form. They were just kind of there, as well as some fossils from other individuals that were not necessarily included or talked about but are in this pit. So that kind of gets rid of the idea of this was a single individual buried in the pit, uh, making the idea that it was more of a hollow that perhaps these remains, even if they were placed into, which is still extremely significant, uh, was not a dug pit and not necessarily fitting the idea of a classical sign of a burial. And, you know, defining what a burial is is very important because the definition does not really change. Uh, it, you know, it's a ritual and burial of the dead. There are many cultural aspects to it, but the very base idea of burying the dead, the idea doesn't change. And so we can't alter it to fit the narrative. We have to look at what the story is and say, does it match? And so far it, it, it's not because this is showing to be more of an accumulation of bones rather than specific burials. Now, this is so fascinating. It's amazing. I don't want anyone thinking, I don't think Rising Star is amazing because it is absolutely stunning. It just is. But that's the problem. Why do we need to exaggerate these features, these exciting things, when it's already so stunning? And that's been many people's problems. So continuing on, we're going to talk about the stone tool that was found in the near the hand in this pit. Uh, now, this tool, quote-unquote, of course, it doesn't show any classical signs of a stone tool. There's no flaking signs. There's no uh, co you know, percussion core. There's no signs that it was created. It actually looks like it was chipped off of the dolomite wall. In fact, it is dolomite. And it's important also to remember that this material hasn't actually been reviewed by hands or eyes. It's been scanned in a big block of stone and we've looked at it through there so no one's handled it no one's done anything with it they've made 3d prints of it uh, i know a few people with them but it's not the same thing and we can't really study it the way that we need to but just the fact that it's there doesn't really necessarily mean anything and the fact that it is the same rock as the cave and it looks like it literally just flaked off the wall i mean there's little evidence of lithic culture present, and we can't really, I don't think, say that's a stone tool, just based on the fact that it's there. The shape of it doesn't even really seem like it could have been used for many things. It doesn't seem very persuasive to me. It could be, of course, you know, again, no one knows. We don't have a time machine. As my co-host of the Paleo Post podcast says, you know, we're trying to rebuild the past by looking into a room through a keyhole. And that's all we can see. And we're supposed to draw the room. Well, you can't see much through a keyhole. And that's what we're trying to do with the fossil record and with Homo Naledi. There's only so much we can see and know. But that's why it's so important that we take the time to gather the evidence, look through it thoroughly, and have others look at it so we can come to better conclusions that might better fit the narrative that we actually are seeing. So the next thing, the next aspect that I want to talk about, the last, or not the last, there's another aspect, is uh, the use of fire in the cave. Uh, it, it was said that there were hearths discovered, you know, a place where you would host a fire, maybe even cook some meat. Uh, there were some burn materials found. And this seems really exciting. Oh my gosh, they found ash, they found burned animal part, you know, they cooked in there. Well, hold your horses. There are other explanations that might be more sound, such as the fact that, first of all, there's no scientific evidence of a hearth. What is a hearth? I mean, there's some stones there with some residue. They haven't really said what it is. Second of all, in African caves, especially in the area that Rising Star is, things fly in. Like, I mean, they literally, like, the air 
pushes things in, things wash in. It's very common for burned materials to find their way into caves like this. It's not uncommon for non-anthropomorphic sources to cause charcoal and residue in these caves. And, and this is the real kicker here, there are unpublished dates, meaning the parts have been dated, the fires have been dated, they just haven't been published, and these dates are extremely young. How young, I'm not sure, because again, they're not published, not 300,000 years old, not somewhere around Homo naledi. And we're going to get into who this could have been in a moment, uh, but I want to talk about the rock art first, and then we're going to get into a little bit more about the history of Rising Star and why uh, the whole idea of it might not be exactly what we were led to believe. So first of all, the cave art. I mean, cave art is its a, one of the earliest signs of, not cave art necessarily, but rock art, one of the earliest signs of human cognition surpassing a certain point where we reach a level of understanding and the ability to have abstract thought like we never had imagination. And we think you need big brains for this. And uh, Lee and his team are saying, no, you don't. Look at Naledi small brain they were making cave art um but here's the problem so the type of rock that the engravings are in a dolomite is known for eroding in a certain way when water moves on it where it literally looks like engravings it it literally does i'm not going to blame anyone for thinking that these look like engravings because they do but all over the place in South Africa, and even in this formation of Brescia, you can see, sorry my cat, you can see dolomite like this. It's called elephant dolomite because it looks like elephant skin. And by looking at the engravings in deep, deep detail, and I've talked to some other people who weren't even involved with this paper, these engravings they're not engravings. They're watermarks. They're natural formations. Some of them might be anthropomorphic, but we're going to talk about why it probably was not Homo naledi if that is the case. But most likely, all of these engravings are natural to begin with. So that kind of throws that whole thing out. And not to mention the fact that none of these have been dated. Excuses have been given like there's not enough calcite or there's too much calcite, which that makes no difference in being able to date the rock art. So we'll see if those dates come out and what happens then. But so far, it's not looking positive for the rock art either. Uh, and a few experts have looked at it and it's not, it's not looking great. So the last part that I want to talk about that kind of ties things in is all of these things are supposed to have been done by Homo naledi. No one else was supposed to have been into this cave until like the 1960s. And then even then, Lee is claiming that they have a strict record of everyone who's entered the cave. Saying only Homo naledi could have gone in, made these engravings, made this fire, etc. That is not the case. That is simply a fallacy. The original cavers who sent the pictures of the Homo naledi fossils to Lee, as we've all seen in the documentaries, Stephen Tucker and Rick Hunter, they were in there first. They saw things that were in there that other cavers had to have been in there first. In fact, they had claimed and knew people who had been in Rising Star before the Rising Star team led by Lee had gone in. Recent humans had been in that cave since the 1960s, caving, exploring, possibly making maps and engravings on the walls, having fires. This cave had been known for decades and explored before Lee and Homo naledi ever came along. And to say that Lee knows every single person has ever entered that cave and that to rule out the fact that any of these things could be made by modern humans is, in my opinion, just too much to swallow. So there you have it, guys. This was kind of a longer video discussing the recent peer-reviewed paper about Homo naledi. And, you know, the reason it's just so important is because we have to realize the science has to come before the media. 
because now we're going to have so much work retracting what was going on because the team, well, of course, these things could still be possible. I'm not saying they're not, but they have to have more evidence to prove that they are, or we're just going to end up in a circle and a loop of not knowing what's going on. And that's the problem of what the team is doing right now with this going on, this entire media blitz before the actual peer reviews came out. I mean, just, it wasn't handled well. And now the damage to public opinion on the field is horrible because so many people think this is what's going on with Homo Naledi, but we really just don't know. And now we have to reverse so much of what people are thinking. And that's where this video comes in. So I hope you liked it. If you learned something, if you found something out, please give me a thumbs up and share it. And if you have any questions, definitely email me at worldofpaleoanthropology at gmail.com or feel free to leave a comment down below. I'll see you guys next time. And for never forget, there's always more to learn.